Jen turns it to it. Uh, Lauren, is, uh, Lauren uh, we're, I was here in Santa Cruz. Uh, I live in the county, have all of my whole life, still do. And Lauren's our connectivity with the communities, with the NAMI, uh, with all organizations in Clare County, which is where we're based. But uh, she and I are in you know, these communities. Yeah, she grew up here as well, near and dear to our hearts. So we're looking all the time to see what we can do to help affect the systems and, and services here in Santa Cruz, where I began my mental health career you know, much, much younger, many decades ago now. But uh, I've been in this my whole life for many, many years here in Santa Cruz as a provider at every level. Uh, my last clinical position was a clinical specialist in psychiatry, and so I'm a nurse psychotherapist and had, had private practices, worked in psychiatric emergency rooms here in Santa Cruz. And I, I got into um, management administration uh, unwillingly, really. I did it because I felt like somebody had to do this, right? I mean, the, I felt like some of the policy decisions, procedural decisions, were affecting the way that I did my work in the emergency room. Um, you know, patients we admit didn't stay long anymore, they used to. Uh, some people we used to admit didn't at all anymore. Uh, and there just seemed to be a change uh, gradually in the funding streams. Mm -hmm. The center caused out more of that in a minute. But anyway, that encouraged me to say, well, okay, you can complain about it. My wife certainly agreed my complaints, or you can do something about it, and so I ended up getting into administration management. Today, today I'm the executive director of El Camino Hospital, and so oversee um, you know, behavioral health services there. We've got lots of outpatient programs. Uh, we, we started a program, only one's kind in the country, uh, for perineal uh, moms. It's an intense outpatient program that bring their babies to groups. Um, it's wonderfully supported by the community of donors, and we have our, our youth programs, Aspire, which stands for after school program intervention, something like that, resilience education. But it's known as Aspire, and so we have that from middle school all the way through transitional age. We use certain programs in Los Gatos, a couple in Los Gatos, a couple in Mountain View at our campuses, both sites. So we, we treat a lot of kids from Santa Cruz and our Las Gatos site. And we would like someday to be able to bring this program, or not very much like to bring this program to Santa Cruz, but it a partnership with Sutter or Dick or somebody. And we want you to. Oh, we'd love to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've got uh, thought disorder programs, uh, we, you know, one of the things about mental health you learn is that you, know, you can't take a whole bunch of mental health patients, okay, I got symptoms, and put them in a group and say, here you are, because it is not, you know, monolithic, right? It is all range of people with various conditions, and they're not the same thing anymore. Their orthopedic injury is the same thing, right? I mean, what do you do? You know, you surgery, the same surgery, or knee surgery, well, maybe their ankle, et cetera. That's kind of how it is for mental health, that's how I like to think about it. And so we've got a thought disorder uh, program that mostly treats young adults, early intervention for psychosis symptoms. And we have mood disorder programs. We have a DBT a track for uh, to introduce them to the DBT systems in the community. And we've got older adult services. Um, we've got an addiction program. We've got a dual diagnosis program. So lots and lots of different programs uh, that we have. And it's not the most uh, cost-effective way. It's actually we've got a consultant come to kind of help us do better financially. First thing he said, well, we got to when you're doing all these specialty groups, you just mix them together and you know more efficient. We said, well, thank you very much, but that's a no for us. Let's go on to something else we can do. So uh, the community has really responded to that. We're creating uh, systems of care where, where um, you know, the, the people, the donor community feel like, okay, my family was touched by that, so, and they've got a place to, 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 you know, there's a lot of money in Silicon Valley. We've got some of that, we $6.5 million. In, in two years, we thought we'd get $5 million, five, so we were very pleased, and we're still raising money. We've got a very dedicated group of people. Uh, big news, a couple weeks ago we broke ground uh, for a what's going to be a 52,000 uh, square feet and probably $60 million new behavioral health building. No one's doing this, hospital based. Uh, we 36 beds, all private. We build it um, like kind of like a hotel. I, I, I mean, this is really expensive. Our board is very committed to this population. If you ask any of the board members, well, you're not profit hospital, we're for the community. Mental health will be the first thing that we talk about. It's, uh, Really from the board. Very, very appreciative of being lucky to be there. Now, um, talk a little bit about what I've done at the state level. I'm the current chair for the California Hospital Association Behavioral Health Center. So I represent all the hospitals in the state, all the psychiatric units in the state, private facilities, everybody who's a member of that in almost every place that is, it's a hospital. So uh, I chair that group. It's my third year, final year as chair, and then I'll step into a past chair role. My focus in that has been to talk about system delivery and system change. I worked hard and successfully on a piece of legislation that would have changed some of the commitment laws in California, not in a severe way in terms of keeping people who didn't want to be in the hospital and didn't need to be, but more about how do we get people access and services. And that's challenging, and I don't even need to go into that with this audience. But we all have, I'm sure, experiences with the health of the system. We were unsuccessful in getting a task. We're going to try a different approach where we're going to really work partnership with California NAMI at state level and organizations and other people in 
try to, you know, rather than the hospital sort of leading this charge, we're going to try to get other people to lead it and maybe not seem as lobbyists or protect their self interest because hospitals don't have the greatest reputation in the world sometimes for behavioral health care. So, how did we get to the system that we're in? I'm going to talk about that for a while. And the thing I won't talk about is the, uh, the shooting death of a mental health client here in Santa Cruz because, you know, I say I wasn't there, no video. This, this, one thing I know about Santa Cruz is they will demand transparency. This population will not accept anything but a full review, full transparency. And you just, it won't happen. I mean, just, they, they're going to do that. They have to do that. The community will demand it. So, what I'd like to talk about is how is there a system of care that is developed? where somebody with those significant symptoms could be in a situation where just five days earlier, uh, you know, he was uh, caged by police, difficult time to take him down from the hospital. Five days later, he's there and he's killed. And so you wonder what kind of system did this come to? Now, first thing I want to say, well, let me say first thing is, they're doing some amazing things in Santa Cruz County. Just tonight, I've touched base with people that I've met, people I knew, and Santa Cruz County is doing a lot of things for people with uh, you know, significant condition, mental health conditions, with integrating the community, with peer groups, with uh, housing support at times, with going to my uh, 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 nephew-in-law, is that the right term, back at he's with the MHCAN, he just talked about the things he's doing, you can see the excitement in the space, and the, and the reward he gets when he's doing So Santa Cruz is doing amazing things. So we're very, very proud of, of what they're doing in that area. But, uh, you look at the streets of Santa Cruz County, and the city of Santa Cruz in particular, and downtown, and we see people with these symptoms, and I've lived in here since 1970, and I was kind of a wall rat as a kid, and it was a real different environment back then. We had beds at Dominican Hospital in the 70s, and they started the uh, you know, neuropsychiatric service on Inline Street. There were, uh, Help Mino started our program in 1961 for inpatient services when we built the hospital. We had 36 beds at that time, too. All the regional hospitals had psychiatric beds, right? everybody did. And that came, people think that came from John F. Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health Act, but actually California was the leader, the leader in mental health care in 1957. That's why I talk fast, so 1957, we passed the Short Doyle Act. And the Short Doyle Act was, uh, and by the way, I've got bipartisanship, sponsored by Democrats, by Republicans, signed by a Republican governor. You know, there was great, and they wanted to take on this issue of state hospitals and, and the communities sending people away and not being um, in state hospital bed population was very, very high in this country and in this state. And so the thought was, let's treat them locally. And so you read this act, and it's impressive to read the 1957, what they wrote. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys would be very proud of the people who were running our government at that time. So some example, let me get a little emotional. I'll get up just in a second. So they did a great job. And um, what they did is, is they called us the Community Mental Health Act. And six years later, and by the way, in 1961, you know, opened our hospital, this was before John F. Kennedy signed the act, a lot of other hospitals did too. The idea was get them out of the state and bring them locally and treat them in the hospitals locally and then bring them to the community. John F. Kennedy in 1963 signed the Community Mental Health Act at the federal level, and I believe, I don't have tremendous research on this, I'm a nerd around mental health stuff, so I've got some more research to do, but uh, that was, we, I believe, very much based on what we were doing in California, because we were doing amazing things. And that allowed funding streams from the federal level to support local mental health services in the community level. And ironically, that was the last act he signed as a legislator, a legislative act he signed as president before he was shot by somebody who, right, had a serious mental health condition. You read about his history, and that goes back to when he was a young man and did not get the care that he should have got. Right? So how ironic and horrible and tragic it was. But John F. Kennedy, uh, through his own family history and background, had an understanding and value of community mental health. So regionally, we had beds all over the place. I mentioned uh, over the hill, San, San Jose Hospital, because American Hospital still has two beds, you know, El Camino Hospital. Um, uh, uh, name a hospital over there, they had beds, they all did, uh, Seton Hospital, uh, all this, and almost all have closed through the years. And, you know, how do we go from a system where we had lots of psychiatric beds, and when you have psychiatric beds like that, and there's a community focused on treating people with significant symptoms, you know, so the behaviors we're seeing in Santa Cruz County and I can speak to this, because I lived in the county since I was 10 years old. Those people were picked up, they were taken to the hospital, and they were kept until they got better enough to release them back in the community. It was not what we're seeing today. That was not the situation. I know, I worked in those hospitals, I worked in Dominican, started in 1983, and it was a different system of care then than we have today. It's a different approach. So I, I, I'd like to say that there's nobody's fault, there's not a person you point to and say, you know, you messed up, you did this, there were unintended consequences to very good intentioned acts. 
And beyond this hospital side, we had a couple of nerdy things I'm going to talk about. One is deregulation that occurred at hospitals. It used to be you had to have a certificate of need, you know, if you were going to open up a Dominican hospital, open up their unit in 1983 because they um, wanted to open up a neuro unit and add beds. And so the county said, that's fine, very good, we'll do this, we can need, but you'll have to build a neural health unit. That's what it was like back then. And all the hospitals understood that psychiatric conditions are part of the health care problem. They understood that back then. Maybe the places were a little unique. You know, maybe they medicated people too much. I'm not saying it's the greatest treatment ever, but it was treatment local in the community. That's the way the system was designed from 1957. Okay, so what happened? Deregulation happened, and hospitals weren't making any money on their psychiatric services, but they were making money on their MRIs or their CAT scans or this or that or the other thing because it was limited. The effort was to limit the competition in healthcare. Right? It was not because you understood that hospitals were providing services that were underpaid, right? And so a hospital understood you have to treat everybody and you have certificate of need because that's the way we can keep our business going. You eliminate the certificate of need, now you have competition, you've got for profit. Prices go down in that, right? Because you know, competition brings down prices, makes it a little cheaper for the government to pay, et cetera. But again, unintended consequences, we can't afford that psychiatric line anymore. We can't do it. We don't have the, the subsidy from the other services to support psychiatry. So they started closing their beds and they were encouraged to close their beds by the hospital associations because they were too expensive to operate when you needed to cut your costs and those things that also made money. So that was a contributing factor. I've got a slide I show where I show because I ran across it, they were trying to dump some stuff. They said, you know, Michael, we're going to dump a bunch of old stuff in your hospital from years and years ago. I first said dump it and I went, well, let me go down and see what they got. I found the most amazing thing. I found what the prices were for services in 1973 at El Camino Hospital for an inpatient bed cost what group psychotherapy costs, et cetera. And I was just fascinated by it because it was pennies on the dollar. And I took, so what I did is I took that 1973 thing, I did a presentation at a symposium, and then I took the 2013, which I guess was when I was doing the presentation, and I showed the, uh, what the inflation rate was over those years, right? So what were those services called? What was the dollar then versus the dollar now? And then I showed the price and cost of services. Well, guess what? The price of hospital services is way up here, and inflation would have about here. So, and why did that happen? Well, one thing that happened: who was working in healthcare typically? Women, and women were making less money than men were, and they were working professional jobs, and they weren't getting paid very much. You went into to be a nurse; you didn't go into to make a living. You went into it because, you know, you had a calling and all that stuff, right? Well, that wasn't acceptable anymore, and it shouldn't be, right? That's right. You should make a living, right? You should make a good wage, but that drove up the cost of care. All the regulations, all the building standards, on and on, lawyers, risk management, all that stuff layers on. Yeah, I, I went to do a talk before our IT group a while ago, and, and the whole room, at least twice the size, filled, standing room only, with people who worked at our hospital in information technology. And I put that, you know, when I started in, in hospital work, information technology with a couple of geeks in a basement. That was it, right? No, all this stuff, it's all required. It's not you know, blowing money. It's, that's what healthcare requires. All that comes with a cost. And so the cost of care has so dramatically risen. Now, what happened to the revenues? Right? The revenues did not keep pace with the cost for the hospitals to do this, and so money was spreading out the way. Couldn't keep these services going. Start closing down the hospitals. Okay, so who provides the care now for these people? Right? So we had a thing called uh, for profit hospitals sprang up because they could provide the care much cheaper than a hospital could. They only did behavioral health, they weren't unionized. I don't know. They, they kept people, a uh, few of them, and, and it's not telling tales out of school, a few really bad players in those days. So they kept people until their lifetime benefits ran out. You guys remember lifetime benefits? And so they kept them, the lifetime benefits went out, boom, discharge. Everybody stayed 30 days. Why did they all why did they stay 30 days? Well, that's when insurance comes out. And so what happened? Well, you can't have that, right? It became too expensive for the insurance companies to provide care. So they invented a thing called, oh, managed care. Let's, let's farm it out to a place that does behavioral health managed care. And this is the, that's a for-profit enterprise. Here's their business model. You give me a dollar because you don't want to pay for, you know, I'll give you a dollar because if the cost is a dollar fifty, I'll give you a dollar when you please take care of the problem for us. Treat all those people. Okay, that's a good savings to you. I understand the model. But I'm going to take 20% of that dollar and I'm going to put 80% to treatment and I'm probably being generous, but maybe worse than that. Yeah. They're not telling us. So I just take what I do. I just took 20% of the healthcare dollar and out of the system. So now we only have 80 cents on the dollar available for treatment. That's the managed care model, right? It's a for-profit model. They make their money on the difference between they're incentivized not to provide care, right? What are they incentivized to do? They're incentivized to not provide care. That's what they're incentivized to do. So now we have patients that used to stay a month or two months 
with significant symptoms, where they're screaming in the streets, that doesn't get better in five to seven days, folks. Maybe it calms down because they got some sleep, some pills, medication, whatever. Look, I mean, they're back out on the street. It is a quick cycle back to those symptoms. That's how it is. That's a mental health condition, right? That's how it, it needs a longer treatment, it needs stabilization, and it needs, it needs a whole system of care after it. But that's not, it, it, the, met, the metrics we use are, uh, with the managed care company, they, they, you know, we don't play that game very much. Right? They know me well, <laughs> but, uh, and it's never personal, I understand. But they'll say, well, Michael, here's the metrics, so we're this managed care company. And you know your report card isn't doing too good over there at El Camino. So, well, report card? What's your report card? What, 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 how am I doing? Are history or English? What? I, I know I got some deficits. You know. Oh, I am the principal of the SPARC program, by the way. I'm principal like Chris Gerald, which is make my principals at school laugh their heads off. And they said, I was always in the principal's office, so. Right, right, right. But anyway, um, so they, that's what they, so what they do is they say, okay, here's the metrics. You keep people too long. We want you down to five days. Five day hospitalization average. And your re actually, our readmission rate was really good. They said you're doing really good on the readmission rate. Now, we did really good on the readmission rate. Guess why? We kept people longer than five days. That's why we did better on uh, readmission rates. We kept, sometimes we kept people a lot longer than five days because that's what it took to get better, right? When you're seriously mentally ill, you're living in tatters on the street, you're in and out of jail, you're eating garbage cans, five day hospitalization ain't going to do it. Ain't going to do it. So anyway, so that was our report card. Information <laughs> I can't believe they're really great, I guess. So anyway, but I told them, well, we're, you know, they want to, tell you, hey, we can, you can make more money. We'll pay you more if you do this. No, we're not doing that. Not doing that. Not not doing that game. What we, what I, I told them, what I want to see on the report card is, what's the family engagement? Did the families come to a meeting with the doctor and the social worker? That should be on the report card, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. right? So yeah. So what's the um, patients buy into recovery? Did you discharge them to the level of care they needed? So, give them back. It'll pass. Right. So, uh, that's not the metrics they're using because the incentives don't drive those metrics. So, when we talk about how the mental health system exists today, that when you walk down downtown Santa Cruz and you see the situation we got, that's the background, folks. That's how it got there. Nobody wanted this to happen. Nobody in the mental health world, nobody at the state level, federal level, wanted to see the system of care that currently we have. But here's what we have. The law of unintended consequences, sometimes it's all you're left with in the end. And again, we're doing some great stuff at the community level. One other thing that happened that was very significant, kind of a coup de craw in some ways, was the realignment capitation system. The State Department of Health managing Medi-Cal, right? So when I started in mental health work at, at a hospital level, you know, uh, the, 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 the county uh, took patients out of jail and they brought them to the hospital. One coming in, and here, here comes the jail, and they're bringing to the patient. And we would keep people longer, et cetera, because we just built the state, Medi-Cal. We just built the state paid bill, right? Because any of the services, you had to document, you had to show it, but the state paid the bill. But the state is spending a lot of money on mental health services in California. And they made the decision, working with local communities, that what we'd like to do instead is decrease hospitalization costs because all the reasons I mentioned is getting more and more expensive. It doesn't cost the same as it did in 1961, even accounting for inflation. What can we do to get these costs down? Really good idea if you think about it. Hey, I got an idea. We'll give you the money, counties. We'll give you the money so that you have spent historically, and you manage it. We're going to do that because we know that you're going to build all these systems of care that's less expensive than hospitals. So guess what happened? Some great programs came to Santa Cruz, right, and all the other counties, and the beds started disappearing. Well, for a whole lot of people, that's great because they can access those care, and for a whole lot of people, they couldn't, right? Their symptoms are too severe. The beds closed down. When I started at Dominican, there were 28 beds. We always had 32 patients. I don't know if any of you had uh, clients and, and so forth at that time, but they were sleeping in a conference room. I'm sorry, you know, we slept, you know, we did. And we shipped them out of the county because we didn't have no beds. But they got help, you know, and we were incentivized to treat them because they weren't using other services. They weren't going to the jails and, and using services there. They weren't on the street disturbing people because the bills were being paid on the state level. There was no capitation to it. So I hear capitation. You know, that's like, to me, not a nice word, you know, not a nice word, because it, it's actually you're capping the dollars that you can spend, and now you have to figure out how to do it. So, yeah, some good things happened with capitation realignment means the county's now controlled. Now, not only got the money, but they got to control how it's spent. Capitation realignment, 1993, 1995, that's when I said, I'm out of here. I got to go work in the, I got to go, I got to, I got, I don't like my job anymore. I can't help people anymore because they're not helping the moment, but we can't get them the services they need. I saw labeling come in, right? 
uh, people who would normally be those, and now they're system abusers and and uh, you know uh, oh and worried well I love that term you know the worried well well actually when you're feeling suicidal you know you're far more than worried you're far less than well but that was the term applied unless you had a serious mental health condition they didn't want to provide services to that group anymore at the funding stream level right that's managed care company the worried well Just, come on you know is this really we really come to this again no one designed it but the incentives drove this process all right so jails you know, become much more commonly used. What's the largest mental institution in the United States? You guys know this. I know. The educated audience here, I didn't tell me. I'm not surprised. We do a lot of work with NAMI with Bill and, and, and we have a great relationship in that for NAMI. Um, yeah, so largest institution and mental institution in the United States, LA County Jail, followed by Cook County, followed by Rikers Island. That's where people are going with these conditions. Now, do you read Peter Gurley's book, Crazy? Great book. I met him, talked to him. We had him speak at one of our symposiums, had dinner with him. And he's just, he's a, a great part of the Washington Post, and he just wrote about his son's experience and his experience with his son trying to get through mental health treatment. And that's the experience that people are having. And it's tragic, it's hard. We're better than this, we're better than this country. So, all right, so what are we doing? So, um, the hospital levels have been, the, this is where the hospital association doesn't like it when I, you know, I'm not, I'm not singing a party line all the time. Um, but the hospitals have stepped out of the mental health business. And they said, well, you take care of it. We can't afford it. Let the counties do it. But the private institutions do it. We're not going to take charge. Well, okay, so it's, if you're a hospital for a community and you're not addressing or at least considering how can we work and how can we make it happen, maybe not have to provide beds, but maybe at least just be part of the community and build the service of care. This is the largest unmet health care need in the country. Mental health, far from can't do anything that is less treated for a serious condition in this country than mental health. We would not do this for cancer, folks. You know, we wouldn't do it for heart disease. Uh, but arguably, this condition is, um, for many people, more devastating. They had a, a survey that said, would you rather have cancer or schizophrenia? Guess what went out? They'd rather have cancer than schizophrenia. That's what it's come to. So there's ways to turn around. But as you can see, you have to undo a lot of things, right? The profit incentives that are there, they don't want to give that up. How do you change that? They've got lobbyists. They've got, you know, whole, you know I don't know enough. Powerful voices, dollars driving their decisions. Counties aren't necessarily going to want to give out their ability to control dollars. Why would they? They want to use these money. They want to help people. But we went from a 28 bed unit that had 32 patients and a bunch more out of county to a 16 bed non hospital private health, you know, uh, psychiatric health facility. Is there less people needing acute services in Santa Cruz County than there was 30, 40 years ago? Come on. You know? Is there, are they able, these very ill individuals, able to step into a peer housing on day one of their sickness when they're knocking on someone's door and threatening to kill them? No. That's a later down the road thing. You have to have these acute stabilization. At our groundbreaking ceremony, we had a wonderful uh, woman talk, and she had her son, and she had talked to me ahead of time, got my number from the county mental health director of St. Clair County, called me up one night. What we had he said, I got it. He's in my car. This young man had been in the streets of San Francisco for eight months, had SWAT teams called out from throughout Shadow, one time, Santa Cruz Police, in Santa Cruz where he was living. He had a knife, and this guy's like six foot five, and he had a knife and he was threatening, and the police backed off, they did a wonderful intervention, and that could have gone a much different direction, folks, and they did that a couple times with this young man. So the parents are very, very thankful for the police, not so thankful for the mental health system. He was hospitalized for a few days at this place, a few days at this place, every place she went, she was told, he didn't want to talk to you, so we can't give you any information at all. So they keep trying to figure out what happens, and he'd be discharged without any contact with him. On what a nightmare! Yeah. And this one on, she's very articulate. She's a journalist. Uh, uh, left her job uh, to uh, try to save her son. Eight months on the street, San Francisco. Got him to our hospital. We treated him two months. Insurance did not pay for two months. This man's care. I said, well, he doesn't meet acute symptoms anymore. He's not threatening anybody. He's not. But he is not engaged. If we discharge him, he is back in San Francisco like that because that's what he wants to do he doesn't get it and through working with him gradually just wonderful staff and gave played basketball with them dribbled around and he began to loosen up his old self came back a bit medications were more effective he became engaged went to a residential partnership we have with momentum he was there then came back to us for six weeks of outpatient in our thought disorder program he's now an a student in film So good outcome. So that's the way mental health should work. We don't get to do it all the time that way, but that's the way it should work. We have to have enough beds to make that happen. It doesn't mean that the 
keep people in the hospital until their insurance runs out like we did before. You know, you have to have utilization of you. You have to justify the expenditure of the healthcare dollar. But I can tell you, this man will cost much less to the system, to our world, to his family, every way, socially, economically. It makes a lot more sense. And, and, and it's, this is not a liberal philosophy. This is the RAND Corporation. This is every study they've ever done shows that effective mental health treatment, spending the money saves, saves money. I talked to the uh, HR boss at um, Lowe's, and he runs their, their benefit program, Lowe's. And I asked at a conference, Innovations Conference in Las Vegas, and he was talking. And so I said, so what about mental health parity, man? Or you got to provide all this mental health. Aren't you, aren't you worried about the cost or how you imagine the cost? I just assume he's an HR guy. They're, they're self-funded, right? So they pay right themselves. They're self-insured. And you know what he told me? He said, poetry. So he understood that um, if you treat people, it saves money because there's less use of emergency rooms, there's less use of there's fewer healthcare conditions, there's less morbid morbidity conditions, there are decreased rate for heart disease, every condition goes down. Goes down. So that was an economic decision. That was not a God above our employees or anything else that he does. You know, they're, they're a good corporation. But that was an economic decision to spend the money on mental health. So what are we doing wrong? So um, it's a challenge. I don't know that more money needs to necessarily flow in the system. A lot goes for infrastructure and bureaucracy, as I mentioned earlier. The room full of IT people, right? Well, the county has that too. You know, the system of care has gotten extremely expensive. We do want high-paid quality staff. We attract fantastic staff at Elkin Hospital because we're unionized. And we pay as well as the ER pays, and they're all in the same union, and I'm happy every time to see that labor cost because we have fantastic staff in the area. So it makes a better outcome for our patients. Anyway, I've taken much time already. So what I would like to do is just uh, any questions you have on the history of mental health or where treatment's going. I've like, been a long day, so I've been up since very early, so that would be not this emotional. Usually just once or twice, give me a moment, I'm good. It's a little longer. I think because I'm before uh, you know, all the family members and friends that help bunch you guys, and a number of people here have, have had people in our programs. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your compliments, for your for the way, you know, that just, that nourishes me, and now it's the outward main thing is to see people get better. So, you know, okay, there. Sure, sorry. Um, what, what plans do the uh, California Hospital Association have to fix things? Alright, good question. Yeah, so I guess I'm supposed to talk about it, too. So, uh, there's more. So, uh, you know what, I'm sorry? Repeat the question. Okay, so what is the California Hospital Association doing to deal with mental health concerns. When I started uh, as the chair of their behavioral health center, that allowed me to be on the board of trustees. So I'm in there with all these major CEOs. You know, I mean, these guys make millions of dollars a year. I'm not kidding. Wow. I mean, that much. I mean, and they're all in this very formal room, you know, very dark, very formal, formal, formal. Board of trustee meeting four times a year. They play all play golf, and they're beautiful. I love those five star places to stay at. I feel like, well, I don't belong in this group, but here I am at the table with them. And so I didn't say much about mental health. I'd have to report a recorder, and it's just a consent agenda. I don't even know address it. But the conversations would happen in the hallways during the breaks, you know. And they start saying, well, so what? The first thing was like, what's wrong with the counties? I think the counties aren't doing anything. The counties aren't doing anything. I said, well, there's, there's a lot that hospitals can do. That would be right there. I mean, you can lay it on the counties, and I'll blame the counties. But where were the hospitals in this? This is where I go off the trail, actually. The vice president of the group said, Michael, you kind of went over the top there a little bit. I was at the state NAMI conference. I spoke at it. We got a, a California Treatment Award, which, which is the proudest work we have. And, yeah, very proud of that award. So, what are hospitals doing? So now over the last three years, the last time I went, they're going, you know what? Maybe we should do more ourselves because the ERs are crowded, their communities are demanding it. What are you doing for this largest unmet healthcare need in the country? What are you doing? And so now they're starting to get it. So the president of CHA, Wayne Donner, his buddies with Jerry Brown, same age, uh, has been in healthcare. He was he was part of the thing, brought in Medicare in 1965. This guy has been around. And he has put forth initiatives and I've been working with him on that. And we'll do some work in my last year as past chair, which starts in January, to make this the focus of my last year with CHA, their executive role, to bring forward these initiatives. These initiatives have to do with access, they have to do with health care delivery system, it has to do with funding streams and silo funding sources. He gets it. And so we're going to work on these. We know that it's a hospital representing these things. We're not going to get a whole lot of airplay because the community doesn't trust hospitals necessarily when it comes to mental health, right? Because you took your kid to the hospital. 
And what happened? They didn't get the help they needed, right? So we don't just think, what, you know, you guys are, you know, we don't have the kudos at this point. Health is the exception to that. But by and large, hospitals have struggled with this, and there's other exceptions too. So, um, yeah, so what are we doing? We're going to do that, and we're going to, what we're going to do, and, and, and um, don't tell about schools, it's not a public announcement, so don't, don't call the, the anywhere, but the, is it the Calvin Endowment Fund, we're talking to them. California Healthcare, right? Uh, so uh, the, uh, the no, no, no. This is the big organization for California, California Endowment and the uh, California Health uh, Fund. Anyway, these are foundation, California Healthcare Foundation, which is formed with Blue Cross and Blue Shield broke apart and went public. They had to give all this money to uh, the uh, to form this foundation because if you're not for profit, if you go profit, you have to give all this money back. You would know what they paid for. So anyway, they went public and they give all this money. We're engaging them and their policies because and they're them. So uh, one of our um, folks in the CHA is on the NAMI, California, and is the incoming president to the California NAMI. And so we're right there, right? We have an opportunity to meet with all, we got to all work together on this. And hold your hospitals accountable. If their idea of working with mental health is to write a $5,000 check to NAMI and post for a picture of the president, thank you for your money, we can certainly use it. Now what are you doing to address the largest health care need in the country and certainly in our county? Keep the pressure on, right? Demand it. The public has a lot more power than you probably realize. So that's what they're doing. We're starting this initiative process, and the CEOs are starting to get it. They're all talking now. I got the last two things, speaking role, you know, it's like kind of hard to get it. And Dwayne telling me, you need to speak. You need to speak. So I just said it. So I'm talking to you now. You know, we need to do more. We need to be in our communities. Um, you mentioned a meeting a representative from Lowe's to talk about uh, yeah. being knowledgeable about County of Santa Cruz mental health officials, yeah. being a member of the community. You have an organization you belong to that is um, incredible. You have a lot of statistics. Um, have Has anyone brought key people like this together to have a closed door session with our five members of the Board of Supervisors to show them how they could save money yeah. with their policies? And closed doors that they aren't embarrassed. Yeah. There's no finger pointing. But when you talk to elected officials about yeah. saving money, then yeah. it's from people who aren't the directors yes. of mental health yes. or employees yeah. of theirs. Yeah. It can make them listen. Yeah. So uh, to that to that point, um, one of the things we're taking on with California Hospital Association, recognizing that this what's going on here is what we call silo funding. So criminal justice has their funding stream, mm -hmm. mental health has their funding stream, and so sometimes doing the right thing for the patient is not the right thing for you financially. Right. It's a different funding stream. They're not capitated in the jail system, right? So if they're in jail, right, that's a different funding source, and it doesn't affect your county budget as much as the mental health. Now, Lowe's is a different deal. It's all together. It's one funding source. See my point? So you got to change the incentives to make that happen. You have to... You have to see the bigger picture. You have to bring people together. You need some regulations around it. And by God, we need state oversight, because that's gone. The State Department of Health wasn't very functional to begin with, that realignment, capitation, counties controlled it, and then they just eliminated it. So who's in charge of the state watching over mental health services? Well, it's a lower level person within the Department of Health and Human Services. I introduced her at a recent symposium and was not impressed. I was impressed with her transparency, that she's kind of wondering what to do. Well, that's a little scary. It's going to be charged with regulating the mental health services for the large state in the country. There's a reason why California has 12% of the nation population and 22% of the nation's homeless. Right? There's a reason for that. I had a question about um, hospital care for youth. Um, yes. When parents call me and they want to know, my child needs to be hospitalized, what do we do? Yeah. I mean, based on my own experience at Fremont with my child, I tell parents it's kind of a waste of time. Because not only, it, it seems like they're all, that it's functioning separately in a little bubble. Yeah. And when you're done with your five day yes. stay or whatever, Goodbye. you look at the psychiatrist or yes. psychologist, whoever you're meeting with, yeah. and they say, well, see ya, go look for some programs. Why yeah. is that? Why well, isn't yeah, there so more I, I, collaboration? Yeah, so, um, you know, I represent Fremont Hospital, my role, you know, they're members of the association, so I won't pick on any particular hospital. I'll say that's endemic to the system, not Fremont yeah. Hospital, of course. But, okay, for that reason, where's the incentive, right? Do they have an incentive 
to spend a lot of time on the phone and do all this collaboration care. Where's the incentive for that? For they don't even call the therapist. Mm -hmm. I, I can't. Or I can't. Any of the it. community it, yeah. people that can support the family. But what if they got a um, report card for that instead of how little they kept the patient in the hospital? Wouldn't that be a better thing on that report card? Yeah. Now they're incentivized to do it. That's what I'm talking about. We've got to change the incentives, and that will change the process. Does that answer your question? Or? I mean, you're validating it. Yeah. Is, are there people that, honestly speaking, are there people in this arena that are all screaming out, saying, what can we do at the higher level? Like you, that are saying, this is really tragic. We need yeah. to do something. Um, yes, are they just trying to keep their head above well, water? Well, most of them are families and consumers, and they've got paid to do it. And it's, you know what I mean, it's more challenging. Yeah. That's why we want the California Endowment Fund, California. Uh, healthcare foundations to do some of that stuff because they can represent it better than I can as a hospital representative, which is true, but I can be at the table. And I'm at the federal level too, I've started starting, uh, or, uh, already started on their advisory thing for the Leadership Institute, which is all hospital systems in the country, I'll be on their, their uh, advisory group at the, to help direct that. So, I, you know, there's, it's, the whole system has to change to make this happen, but the incentive processes have to change. For me, uh, 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 with uh, Sutter system, and with, I tell you, Sutter gets it, especially, by the way, be proud of your Santa Cruz Sutter, they're driving the change for a whole Sutter system. They're saying this is not okay. What can we do better? So, you know, I know they've gotten a lot of criticism for not doing it, and they've heard that criticism. Speak up. Speak up with the Sutter people. Speak up everywhere. And so we're meeting with Sutter. Tomorrow I got a meeting early in the morning with Stanford, and they're bringing their whole, their whole um, adult services department heads, uh, chief, chief of psychiatry, business people, because I presented them with a paper saying we can build a system for collaboration. And it was kind of arrogant, I called a white paper, set it out. I'm thinking, you know, what the hell's this guy? But you know what? They want, they want to hear it. And we're going to talk about building a collaborative model with Stanford. Where did Stanford got research? Where they got residents? Where they got funding streams for mental health? What does Sutter have? Primary care, right? 5,000 primary care doctors in Banff. Right? And, and one million lives. They've got that. Co-located services. What does El Camino bring? Programs. Let's get to, what's the competition about? Why are we not talking? Let's make this, you know, we all got to come together, you know, then you can. Yeah. You know, that's what it's about. And that's what drives me every day to do what I do. And there's people who, who do want to help and want to do it. It's just hard. It's hard work because the incentives don't, don't do it. The incentives argue you not to provide mental health care. All the incentives are built not to provide the care. Yeah, we got to change all that, you know, and make, it, and make the incentives more than just our heart. We have to make it so the business leaders who are removed from that heart you know, of the psychiatric mercy nurse that I was get it, right? And they all get it through financial rewards. And there's some other questions. I was going to ask, um, I heard you say like holding hospitals accountable and incentives and things like that. What's something that actual community members and like people can do, like personally do, yeah. to help change those things? Obviously, a lot of things need to be changed. Yeah. Yeah. But what can we do and from not like an elected official and all right. that? Well, NAMI has enormous support uh, of the enormous uh, reputation uh, because of the great, great stuff over the I've watched this grow as an organization in my career. And uh, because you're not making any money on this deal, right? Oh, and, and I do want to throw out there, because I picked on everybody else, including hospitals I represent, NAMI's got to be careful too because there will be some financial incentives for them also. Some NAMI's have pretty big contracts with their counties. And so I was kind of shocked at a meeting one time where I heard the, a, a, a director of a county system say, you know, all oh, the police that bring these people to us, they're just trying to clean up their streets. You know, we, you know, we're, they don't really need And I mean, I was shocked that she would say this. I think it was a moment of weakness. I know her, she's better than that. But the NAMI person didn't say anything. I called her up and said, I didn't want to say anything. I mean, it's what, you know. And, and she's a wonderful person, but, but they have, I said, did they have a contract? You know, they have to think business decisions when they communicate people. So I don't know if you guys have a contract with the county for any services. If you do, you have to know that and maybe look at your corporate structure so that never influences your advocacy. And your advocacy is very strong. If you guys say, we want the chief of police to come here and address our group, that chief of police will be here. Right? I can't remember where our Danner came when he was alive, because you guys wanted to talk to him about why mental health people are being criminalized when they need treatment. I remember that meeting many, many years ago. I was there. So yeah, that's it. You guys have strength. You have strength because you have numbers, and you don't have an agenda except to change the system for the better. So use your voices. You have a strong voice, and you know. What, what about the parity? Uh, it, it seems like that should be a very sudden, you know, benefit. Yeah, okay, so here's where parity's at. It's worse on the public side than the private side, but it's bad on the private side. Okay, so now the insurance sure companies going to use to say, well, you, don't, you know, we're not going to cover your site. Or I'll tell you what, you come to the hospital, we'll cover you for $300 for your entire stay. I mean, everything else out of pocket. I mean, come on, that was the mental health system before parity. 
right? So now we have parity. God loved parity. Patrick Kennedy carried it. In the Senate, it, I'll tell a story. Pete Domenici, right? Budget hawk. You want to go to a Republican with a budget hawk? Nobody had a better reputation for cutting the budget than Pete Domenici. And he and Paul Wellstone had the, if you talk to Pete Domenici, he'd call it the Domenici Wellstone Act. Talk to Wellstone, he'll call it the Wellstone Domenici Act, right? They're proud of that legislation. That was mental health parity. Why? Pete Domenici has a daughter who's schizophrenia. Okay, so yeah. that impact. That hit home, and he, God bless him, he made a major change. So I'm also talking about this track. So parity, okay, so parity has problems because now they have to cover your psychiatry visit, right? So finding a psychiatrist in the Silicon Valley who's going to take what UVH is going to pay. When you have millionaires, you can't cross the street without hitting a millionaire. They don't have to take that insurance. It's UVH, right? So if you're somebody who doesn't make a million dollars and you have United Healthcare and you have UVH as your payer, Good luck finding a psychiatrist <laughs> yes. who's going to take that. <laughs> so they have parity. Yeah, we'll cover you. Yeah, you get covered, man. Yeah, go find a psychiatrist and who's contracted, and they'll show you the list. And they're called um, phantom panels. Sometimes they're called uh, death panels because they're literally dead. The psychiatrist. I'm well, <laughs> <laughs> saying, I'll, I'll look at him a year later. I'll say he's just as dead as he was a year ago. Maybe there's some miracle cure that he'll come back and be under panel. But I'm not wagering on it because he wasn't. You know, he's dead a while. So we call them phantom panels. And if you do call them up, and I, I our chief, chief psychiatrist is on the panel for 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 these companies, and I have, try to have a meeting with him, and the phone kept ringing. I said, pick it up. He said. Um, my, my practice is currently closed for new patients. No, 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 no. So I wanted to say, excuse me, my class, I'm listening to this over and over again. I'm going, what the heck? And, and they would say things, and they'd say, yeah, and they always say it the last one they called, that was the last hope, right? So they can't find So what do they do? They, you know how many calls I get from friends and people I know because they know I'm in the business? Tell me, can you find a good psychiatrist? I'm going to have to pay out of pocket. I can't find anybody. And these are families who are struggling. Yeah. They're struggling, and they have to pay for something they got an insurance card in their pocket. Again, yeah, cancer. Heart disease, orthopedic injuries. Tell me another field where this happens, where you have to pay. Yeah, you know, that's, you have not, that's not parity. It's not parity. Yeah. And the public side, horror story, born, family said, called me and said, okay, we have Medi Medi-Cal, but it's not severe. They've got mild problem, severe, and this whole process. Even they admit it's not easy. It's got to change. So they were told, okay, we can pay for psychiatrists, uh, but you're going to have to go find one and get them to agree to contract with us, and then we'll cover it. You can talk one into contract. What the hell? <laughs> okay, so now I'm an insurance broker? So that I get my kid help? I'm not kidding you. This is a true story. And then even after that, you fight them for two years to get them to pay the parity they're supposed to pay. Wow. Yeah, so that's not parity. It's parity because it's covered, but it's not funded. Then that's really not parity, is it? NAMI today saw the email come across from, I guess, National NAMI, a press release saying, hey, parody guys, and they had to do some work on that. Kudos to NAMI once again. So they're doing, you guys are doing work, you're exposing this kind of stuff. And lawmakers, by the way, powerful voice at the Sacramento level, NAMI, and that's why hospital associates say, we gotta work with these guys, we gotta work with these guys, and we gotta get them to see that hospitals really do, and we gotta build, we gotta, we can't just say what, we gotta invest, put the money where the mouth is, and then we'll get the support from NAMI. We certainly found that here in San Antonio County. They're, they're just one full, and we work very close together. Members on discharge, in your employ, all that. They're on the unit all the time, and they do support groups there on the, in our conference rooms. We're very integrated with NAMI in San Clair County. Question. I'm just wondering if you could speak to um, your opinions on AB 3632. Is that right? 32. 3632. Yeah, and just Child and just how um, public schools are now being yeah. taking on more costs. Yeah. All right. So good question. So follow the money. Follow the money. So uh, we passed an initiative in California, Prop 98. Uh, I am really a nerd. I'm embarrassing myself. But anyway, so they fund um, uh, the schools get so much percentage of every dollar in taxes, state law, right? Well, mental health services, you know, the money's got to come from somewhere. So they got together and they said, well, we're going to make the schools responsible for providing mental health care. It's actually pretty clever. Answer came up with that. So that's where the 32, 36, 32, and it's to the degree that affects their education. Right, so it's kind of weird because schools, what are they, how are they going to do mental health care? Uh, who are they going to do it with? And so it's just they hire a lot of interns, and, and that's kind of an invalidation at times. I love interns because we train them, and you need a new workforce. When you're working with a kid with very serious conditions, and they're working an intern, you got to kind of question, you know, is that the level of care that they need? I'm just saying. So a lot of strategies that way, and there's all kind of doing, trying to do things you know, as cheap as they can, but. We've got a great relationship. We're, we're working with Mountain View Los Angeles School now where we're going to be providing on an education basis um, mental health training and DBT skill management 
with, uh, and, 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 and we're not charging, there's no therapy, there's, you know what I mean? It's just education, because a lot of mental health work is what it is, is education, how do you manage your symptoms? It's not because you're sick, 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 it's because you need to learn, it's education. So our SPIRE program, we're trying to make it less stigmatized for people, parents especially, by the way, for their kids to get treatment because they don't want to be the kid in a mental health program, kind of scary, right? They know they need help. So um, we went through, and Lauren, kudos, I told her she came on board, I said, you got your work cut out for you because you're going to get our SPIRE program accredited by Western Association of Schools and Colleges. By the way, no, no. Probably. Okay, back to you. That is moments, I warned you already. So Western Associated Schools and Colleges came out, did a survey, unbelievable amount of work Lauren did, two-step process, two surveys, and they said, absolutely, you're doing education because the kids are learning skills to manage stress. And why wouldn't they get credit for that, right? They're learning algebra, learning, learning all these, why wouldn't you get credit, why wouldn't you get credit for learning how to manage your symptoms, how to manage your emotions? So five gets credit, only one in the country. So other people can do this. Uh, the, the SPIRE program was leased by uh, Hope Hospital in, in Orange County. We had another hospital wanting to lease it, and they said, well, we, we started already, we, well, you weren't ready to start it, and we had to discharge one of our patients because insurance stopped paying and said, you're done, we're not working with you. Because that's, we don't discharge anybody because insurance stopped paying. We will keep everybody. They agreed to get treatment. We have a commitment to getting that treatment. The insurance company doesn't want to play, we'll appeal, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, uh, put, put uh, tax receipts, we'll, we'll, we'll bug them, we'll, we'll, you know, but we're going to treat that person. And i got to tell you, some of the insurance companies will aspire, when we started SPIRE program, that's only six weeks, and their motto is, when the kid was no longer suicidal, sorry, I've been paying attention to this room, sorry, I don't know if no longer suicidal, discharge that kid. They're not, their symptoms are better. Congratulations, El Camino, discharge. And, you know, find a therapist, discharge, all that. I said, well, no. They're, because what's going to happen when the next crisis comes? So, um, they got to learn the skills. Because it's not enough. We looked at when we started to do adolescent care, we looked at uh, hospitals everywhere and, and out and intensive outpatient programs everywhere. And every, by the way, every place kids got better. Every place got better. Well, why did they get better? Crisis had passed. All the families that are supportive now, boom, 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 all this stuff, they're sleeping, you know, much things are better. But what happens next when the crisis comes? They don't have the skills learned. So we teach DBT, which I was going to talk about tonight. Uh -huh. uh, but what are the skills to teach is validation and based on that incident that occurred in the community, it would be very invalidated to come talk to you tonight about DBT after the community had this horrible event happen. So that's one of the key, key skills for parents to know. But anyway, so they learned the skills, and the insurance company started going, why not? I mean, and there was reviewers on the line, right? And they said, you do that. But they said, if you had the family meeting, yeah. Well, yeah. We've had lots of family meetings, and they come to support groups, and they come to education groups, because they got to learn the skills too. And the, nobody does this. We weren't doing that. And so now we get paid. We never, well, never, Almost never. And by the way, six weeks, I well, let's do eight. I can pay for six, let's do eight, which is about as long as the kids could agree to. So it's now an eight-week program, four days a week, for uh, the uh, transition age youth who started that program, also middle school programs, three days a week, but they stay 12 weeks. And they learn all these skills to manage stress in their life, and they get academic credit for it. Instead of saying I'm in a mental health program, they say I'm taking classes to learn how to manage stress, and I get school credit for it. How cool is that? Yes. <laughs> So I'm really interested in how we define medical necessity because that drives a lot of yeah. the, what happens in the hospital and yes. afterwards. So right. you know, every time for youth they're readmitted yeah. to the hospital, they have to add a medication to justify you, you, medical necessity. You see necessity. the psychiatrist and it will add medications so they can keep getting funded beyond the point where they really like to. And I'm telling you, you know, this. Please, please, treat the doctor, treat the patient the way you want them to treat. We'll fight the fight, and so we're fighting the fight as best we can with the payers. Medical necessity, so guess what? I did a study on this and presented to the hospital association. I took a patient that we had admitted, and the insurance company didn't want to pay for the patient. The patient had, uh, was going downhill, but had a serious suicide attempt like six months previously. Well, now he's not saying he's suicidal, but all the symptoms are there, right? So we admitted him because we were really worried this is where he was going based on what his behaviors were. And, and most people who are going to kill themselves don't necessarily say and announce, I'm going to kill myself, particularly men. And so we felt he was at high risk and he was the right decision. Insurance company said, no, look at our medical necessity criteria. It's on our website. It's in your provider handbook. We don't cover this. So what I did is I took all the different insurance companies and I went through each one. So this one pays for it. This one doesn't. This one may. 
how the hell are you going to run a hospital? Are you really going to say, well, you have UVA, so let me do this treatment plan. You have Blue Cross, let me do this treatment plan. You have Medicare, come on. What is the way to treat patients? Let's do that. And there's a rule with Medicare that if you take Medicare, you have to have the same criteria as the public, as the private pay patient. Because Medicare says, if you're going to take our money, you have to treat us equally with, with, with the private true patients. It's a damn good law, of course. And so we wrote our mission, you know, our criteria is based on Medicare criteria, not based on what UBH wants and Magellan wants. And UBH and Magellan, and I don't want to say the companies, so those two companies start with you and him. They're, um, <laughs> we have better relationships now than we did then. But um, tricky, uh, anyway, so they're uh, saying, well, that's fine, you keep them, but we're just not going to pay for it. So you can have your own medical necessity criteria, but this is ours for payment purposes. Well, that's pretty clever of you to do that, but, you know, it's not, not too good for patient care delivery. So we struggle with denials, not so much managed care company because we have a very aggressive way of dealing with them. Uh, you know, we just jump on them when they deny us for care. We consider an emergency. We consider our paying partner. We don't. You are concerned about this, our partner. Let's go in here. What can we do about it? And basically, and we get the patients to sign forms and we appeal to the part managed care. We're pretty aggressive with denials. Now the public side's a little bit of a different matter because the Medi-Cal patient We'll get uh, better, stabilized, but what can we do? There's not enough residential beds, long list for an IV bed. They're, if we release that person, they're back on the street, and you know what's going to happen. So there we're stuck. We keep patients 40 days, sometimes longer, because we don't have the right place to send them because there's a shortage of services for them to step into at the public, at the public level. So that's a tough one. There's no way we have a appeal process for that, but it's pretty weak. So we lose a lot of money on our Medi-Cal patients because we're not, uh, there's so many denials, you know, and then we have more hospital unpaid. But we're not going to release them because of that. We will keep them until we feel that they're safe on discharge. You intimately know Santa Cruz County, being a long-term resident. Yes. And you've watched the history. Yes. If you were to have your position at our local psychiatric facility versus at El Camino, what would be a punch list of the top five changes that you might make? Um, all right, I would do a, a collaboration model. I would um, have decisions made. I would work with the police department, with the community. I would have, you know, analysis of all these things at a risk management level. Um, I would find the best ways of managing healthcare dollar among my peers and community and, community, and other hospitals in other counties. And I would advocate uh, for um, more hospital beds because it's the right thing to do for the community. But I tell you, the incentives aren't built. So we've got to build the incentives for that. So I might say, let's build the incentives for that. Let's look and combine maybe. How about if we took the person idea? How about we took the people that are mentally ill in jail and what they cost and combine those dollars with mental health treatment? Hey, guess what now? Mental health treatment makes more sense because they're going to go around and around in jail. I look at mugshots.com periodically for Santa Cruz and the same faces appear. That gives me, uh, gives me a little inspiration to keep doing what we do. And they're all the same people over and over again. It must be cheaper, right? To hospitalize them, even if it's involuntary, give them the treatment they need, reconnect with the family if you can, create a new family if you can, with people like Patrick, who does that work in the streets. Do what we can, and I think that will save money, but you have to, it can't be siloed funding. If it's siloed funding, that doesn't work. You have to combine it and look at the whole person and do that. So that's, I do that. There are some cool things that are happening, whole person care, is happening from uh, the part of ACA, so the federal government's recognizing we take a large piece of, unlike other countries, by the way, we take, uh, we have a ratio, I can't remember the ratio now, but it's like 70% of, and 80% of the dollar. If you combine social support dollars and healthcare dollars together, in the United States, we pay way more of that dollar for healthcare and not very much for social support. It's the opposite, opposite in the European countries and single-payer countries, G, Y, okay? That's the difference. And if you provide those social supports to that kid who's graduated from the foster care system, right, without a family, and they're 18, boom, they're gone, what if you did all this stuff, starting at age 16 or 15, all the things you need to do so that person doesn't end up, you know, lining up the hot rails uh, down by the uh, levee, you know? He's got another thing to do. He's got, he's got an opportunity, he's got job support, education, all that stuff. You know, we're not doing that. We're not paying for that stuff. We used to. And I got my career started with department rehabilitation dollars, you know? So a very basic level, but the support was there for that. And a lot of things and programs that were around, but it, 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 not really kind of, uh, so anyway. So there's still some, great, still some great programs out there being critical, but um, that's what I would 
push for is more social support dollars, so that they're not, you know, thrown back on the street with nothing, and um, uh, more longer hospitalization stays, so we can truly stabilize that person and get them into the services they can now benefit from. That's what I would do. Let me know we're out of time. I'll just keep talking. That's the other thing I'm going to talk for. Yeah, just, All right. Think about uh, Laura's law. Yeah. Um, I understand that it's a state law that's passed, but each county yeah. has to Correct. pass their own participation in this. Correct. So every law that we pass for mental health services in the state has to run through the County Mental Health Direct Association. And they don't support everything. So Laura's law, the compromise there was you guys know Laura's law, how it came, and it's a lot of money yet. So what it is, it would mandate outpatient care. So it would say, you have to get treatment. When you've been threatening to kill people, hey, you know, it's not okay, man. You know, you've got to see a doctor. You've got to get treatment. You've got to do these things. So how do you make that involuntary? So the thing is, it's really not involuntary. We'll talk about it in a minute. So they agreed, the county health directors finally agreed, because the legislature is getting a lot of pressure to do something. And so they agreed to do what was law that only was voluntary. So only one county did it, Nevada County, Laura lived and was murdered. Who was a no health care worker killed by a general health patient. And um, then uh, LA County did some stuff and they do it different ways. And now there's kind of a mushroom. You know why? Because people like you are saying, come on, man. Downtown ain't what it used to be. I can't, you know. I mean, this is what's happened to our towns and cities everywhere, not just Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz has pretty bad. But I took a trip to uh, up to Red Bluff, where I was born, and Central California, so it's, it's everywhere, man. Small towns everywhere. You see it everywhere. And our communities, uh, you know, you used to need to use the bathroom. Remember you needed a bathroom? You go to a place to use a bathroom? Now you got codes and keys, and you know, you can't use the bathroom anymore. Why? Because, you know, somebody OD'd in there and died, you know, and uh, somebody else did, you know. I mean, our world has changed because of this, man. We've got to get this treated. So Laura's Law, because I'm wondering, Laura's Law, what that did was do this mandate outpatient. If you read Laura's Law, a lot of the advocacy agents were against it. It's actually a, a commitment to serve to treat you because they can't put you back in the hospital because you didn't take your medication or didn't go to a group. They can't do that. Laura's Law doesn't allow for that. What it does say, it allows the people who write or eligible right to the 150s can now come and assess you and make sure that you're not threatening to kill people, not threatening to blow up your neighbor's car. And you know what? That makes common sense to me, right? When you've done something like that, that's a pretty good idea to have somebody checking in on you and make sure that you're safe. So that's all Laura's Law does. It mandates that you go to treatment. If you don't go to treatment, okay, but now we're going to see whether or not you're still safe. And we'll take you to the hospital if you're not. That's Laura's Law. So I think it's a great law. Uh, I understand the advocates were against it, but when they talk about why they're against it, we should read it's not, in fact, what Laura's Law is. It's a lot of misinformation about it. Counties, don't, for the most part, don't like it because it mandates them to do all this treatment, and again, they want to be able to control the dollars as they see fit. I understand that. Nobody wants you to tell them, have your grocery money, you got to spend this much on veggies or anything else, right? They don't want to be told how to spend their healthcare dollars. They want to use it what they see in our community. So that's their objection to this law. So that's it. I'm supportive. So could we, as NAMI, uh, go down to the Board of Supervisors and uh, get on the agenda and say, yes, we want yes. this, that's and what we want this for our county? That's what they've done in other communities. You bet. Yeah. They have, and you'll get a lot of double talk. You'll get cats say, "Well, we're looking at it, but we're doing this other wonderful thing," and they'll treat, and they'll invite the you. By the way, you want some money for your program? I mean, no, this is serious. This is what's happening. Yeah. You got this. You got to do it. You'll get your group together, your board together. We're going to support this. Here's what we need to do to support it. You know, and then do those things, and that's what's happening in other communities, and that's how they got the world. Because you guys have a powerful voice because you're not seen as an incentive. Your, your incentive is to make it. Yeah. Your loved ones and the system that it. that's your incentive. Who's going to help you that? You have a lot. You can get a state legislator in here. You can get all kinds of people because you guys carry the freedom. You know, I can tell you that because we've had some disagreements in the military. You know, eat our banks and stuff like that. National, our state family did not support it until we tried to pass the hospital suit, AB 1300. It did not pass uh, because, in large part, Cabinet Health Director didn't like it, NAMI didn't like it. It's been, it's been, you know, that it just it broke down. It wasn't good. So we got a lot of repair work to do on that. I think it's a good law, but. Others disagree. They were worried that we didn't have, they were worried they'd be 1300. This is where we're going to make it more possible for ER doctors, for example, right? They want fitness because a lot of chemicals let them. My God, you know, police officer over here can write one, but a freaking physician with the ER can't write one because they didn't want people hospitalized necessarily. I don't know. So we wanted to change some of that stuff, but we didn't have any trust with NAMI because they go, you guys don't, you know, all you do is dump my patient by blood room. You know, that's the reputation hospitals have. We got a lot of repair work to do there before we can make more of that. But you guys, are good to go on this stuff. They can put a lot of pressure to bear. The other thing I want to say, Carol, is that 
there's going to be something about this case for Sean. Right? There's going to be some kind of commission, be some kind of study. It's going to happen because I just, before I started over in this room, interviewing with the Sentinel uh, writer who's all over this, and you guys are very vocal about it. Candlelight Vigil Center, here's my warning. Don't let the fox guard the hen house on this. They'll say, well, we're going to start this commission, and the county health director's going to appoint, and just, wait a minute. They're defending the current system. You need an independent, this is what happened in Santa Clara County, probably read about it, jail inmate, serious mental illness, killed by guards. Those guards are now in prison, charged with jail, charged with murder, right? So what does Santa Clara County do? They're horrified by it. Did they have, you know, the, the sheriff run a commission, blah, blah, No, they hired a judge who was very strong in health advocate. We know where we can step up with the minimum key partner of ours for residential care. And they had an independent body, and they were harsh, man. They were harsh on the jail. They were harsh on mental health. And guess what's happening? Lots of change is now happening around that. A lot of funding going to jail diversion programs, you know, crisis management services, different ways, and get those mental health patients more and more out of prison. That's the power of an independent, so keep that. Don't allow them to run how this discussion goes. Make sure that the people that are representing are people who are about the community. That's my warning. Any other I've taken a lot of your time. Thank you.